objectives here. Uh, read them if you want. Don't. Don't care. Uh, select the topic. So we're going to cover some biliary disease, um, diseases of the gallbladder, more in, uh, some of the, in this lecture I think I wrote it um, initially for like the GI section so there's going to be some stuff in there that's not going to be a whole lot of information or a lot of extra information that's not going to really be pertaining uh, to emergency medicine so we'll kind of just skip over it slash kind of talk about it. You guys should already know about it anyways. Um, small bowel, uh, we're going to talk about concise diverticular disease, uh, even though that's not small bowel. Uh, most of the time it's deception, ischemic bowel, and small bowel obstructions. Okay. So biliary dyskinesia, biliary colic. So this is just poor biliary motility, um, poor uh, excretion of bile from the gallbladder, from either uh, problems with the gallbladder cell, stones, um, it can be secondary to super concentrated bile that precipitates stones. Epidemiology is young, old, women, um, pregnant, sometimes get it worse. Uh, what's the uh, typical mnemonic? You guys are the 40, fat, fertile. Does that sound familiar? Have you guys heard of that before? Yeah, see, this is not fun stuff, but we got <laughs> Uh, Signs and symptoms, right upper quadrant abdominal pain, epigastric pain, sometimes radiates to the right shoulder, post postprandial pain, so usually they'll get it after um, they eat. You know, you'll eat a big, fatty, greasy meal, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, my stomach hurts, you know, right here, it's really bothering me. Well, that's because um, your gallbladders want to contract to release some of those digestive enzymes. It's having trouble doing that, either because it's blocked or it just has bad motility, and so those enzymes kind of build up and cause some... Uh, problems in your gallbladder or liver. Uh, pain gets worse and, and it kind of subsides afterwards after your gallbladder kind of chills out a little bit. Uh, labs imaging, CBC, CMP, lipase, um, you can do a right upper quadrant ultrasound is helpful in these. Um, the uh, CCK simulated Coley gravity word, yeah, you know that's the one where they inject the medicine that stimulates your gallbladder contract, right? We're all familiar with that. And we're not going to do that in the ER, so we don't need to talk about it. High scan, you can set them up for an outpatient high scan as well. Uh, most uh, most of the time, it's going to be a right quadrant abdominal ultrasound or a uh, CAT scan. Now, it's difficult to say clinically whenever you're doing these things what is truly. I'm not even going to try this one. Uh, what is truly uh, biliary dyskinesia versus cholecystitis versus cholego? I mean, you know, clinically they're all going to be close to the same signs and symptoms. So just because, you know, I have this down here as far as right of quadrant ultrasound and I don't have CAT scan on there, that's just because it's specific for this disease process. That doesn't mean in your initial workup you're going to go one or the other. I think either way is appropriate. You know, if you can try to get away from as much um, radiation as you can, that's great. Ultrasounds are nice and fast if you have a good ultrasound tech or department. Um, a lot of times, I think you guys are doing ultrasounds now here, right? Like getting trained on them? Kind of. Yeah. They're going to have a little bit of Okay, yeah. So ultrasounds are like, ultrasound is the new thing. Like in, I mean, it, you guys are kind of getting touched on it. I didn't get any training on ultrasound zero. They didn't even show us what an ultrasound machine was. Uh, but now ultrasound is, especially for emergency medicine, like that's it. So if you can go to an ultrasound class after you're done with this, if you work in a place where you use ultrasound enough and you can get um, good at it, ultrasound is like the new thing for everything. They're talking about, I read a paper the other day about ultrasounds for retinal detachment. Like ultrasound in somebody's eye. 
I you put it like that's what they use it for, and it's good. I don't know how you put gel <coughs> in somebody's eye, but it works. So I think they go through the eyelid. Sure. On yeah. top of I mean, the ultrasound is like the new thing for emergency medicine, used for everything. I know a lot of physicians uh, that use it for a lot of stuff, and I think the newer physicians are being trained on how to do their own, you know, quick gallbladder ultrasound. So. Um, you know, there's a few in the more academic large hospitals, and I'm not trying to get off too much of a um, A lot of the ER doctors walk around with an ultrasound like to every room. Like you just carry it around. It's like a stethoscope now. So be thinking of that. Yeah, you joke, but it's serious. It's like it really is. They walk around with it all the time. Uh, etiology, so... Wow, uh, this word. That was quick. Okay. Uh, diagnosis, history, labs, imaging, treatment is going to be surgery. Uh, just yank your gallbladder out. I mean, I'm not a big GI guy, so but that's what I would. You know, a lot of people, I think, do. If they have problems with it. You can try low-fat diet, pain meds, watchful waiting. You change your diet up, eat better, eat healthy. Sometimes these things will get better. Depends on what the cause is. If it's stones and things like that, those aren't necessarily just going to go away. But a lot of times. You can live with gallbladder stones and biliary dyskinesia your whole life and have zero problems with it. But if it starts to give you some um, problems, then you just need to have to take it out. Get a general surgery consult. A lot of times this is an outpatient deal. You don't need to get a sort of surgery consult from the emergency department as long as it's not infected. You don't have any signs and symptoms of cholecystitis. Um, diagnose biliary dyskinesia all the time. Send them outpatient for a right of water and ultrasound. Outpatient, I don't even get it in the ER and then have them follow up with the surgeon then. And that's all going to be based on uh, these labs that you're getting here. You know, so normal, normal CMP, CBC, everything looks good. Clinically, the vital signs all look good. Um, you know, these are fine to diagnosis clinically um, as uh, biliary dyskinesia, biliary colic, and then have them follow up outpatient for it. Okay, cholelithiasis, gallstones, not going to go over all these different types of stones here. I think we. You guys should have covered that well in GI. Uh, it's not really a big deal in emergency medicine. Uh, women get it more than men. Don't you like that fancy graph? It just says one thing. I, mean, I don't even know it needed a graph on there. It's like women, greater sign, men. That can probably fit the whole page. But there's a graph if you guys want to make things that look fancy and stuff. And it's in Europe too, so it's super fancy. Uh, Sign symptoms, like I said before, most are asymptomatic. You can go your entire life and have gallstones and not know it, or you can become symptomatic when you have them. You know, it's just kind of a crap shoot. There's really no rhyme or reason for it. Um, the signs and symptoms are consistent with biliary dyskinesia. Signs and symptoms for a lot of small bowel, non traumatic abdominal pain are going to be the exact same. It's going to be abdominal pain in a specific location, nausea, vomiting. Um, you know, the devil's in the details of these about whether they're postprandial, preprandial, things like that, whether you're dealing with a GI ulcer or something like that. It has a lot to do with when uh, you eat and when those symptoms come on and what makes it better. Uh, diagnosis ultrasound is most sensitive for these because you can see the lack of echogenicity in the shadow that forms. I think we'll look at another picture of that here in a little bit. Uh, CT is usually first line, um, unless you're in a large tertiary hospital, like I said, that has access to quick and available ultrasound. Um, but like I said, a lot of times you're not going to be like, oh, I'm looking just for a gallstone and not anything else. You know, so it's not as easy to say uh, what you need to do or these symptoms don't differentiate out very well. Uh, treatment's nothing unless you have pain or complications. And then if you do, just get surgery and get it yanked out. Complications, obviously, are cholecystitis, pancreatitis, cholecystitis, cholecystitis, we'll talk more about this one. Okay, so you can see um, here, now obviously this is a CAT scan, this is an ultrasound, right? Okay. So you can see these hyperpigmented stones here, so they're going to turn up white, kind of like what bones do on a CAT scan, because uh, they're very dense and they soak up a lot of radiation. If I explain to you guys about how, is you guys explain about how CAT scans and radiation work, stuff like that, about how more dense objects become more brighter, and how less dense objects are darker. So obviously air, there's no density to it, so it's black, and bone is very dense in some areas, and it shows up very white, and so there's varying degrees of that. So here, um, we see some calculi here, uh, 
This is an ultrasound you can see by the echo window. And then the, this characteristic shadowing behind the stones, that's because when the sounds are, uh, when the ultrasound is uh, produced, it hits the um, whatever object it is and then bounces back to the receiver, and that's how things. And so you have a lot of bounce back on these hyper dense, they don't penetrate, so you don't see uh, any images behind it, you get the shadow, and that's characteristic of it. Any questions on that? Good, because the back button doesn't work, so we're not going back. Uh, so, cholelithiasis. So, this is going to be a stone from the gallbladder that gets stuck in the common bile duct. Uh, it's epidemiology, same as cholelithiasis. Uh, signs and symptoms, like I said, it's going to be the same for everything. This is a boring lecture. It's like everything sounds the same. Nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, postprandial pain, uh, things like that. Uh, a few of these caveats here is you can have some component of jaundice as it affects liver enzymes and biliary reproduction, or, or bilirubin, not biliary reduction, bilirubin excretion. Um, so that's going to be another thing. That would be pretty nasty stone where you have a complete obstruction. All right, so you guys know all of this, right? All the branches of your bile tree and common bile ducts and all that stuff, right? Oh, you're shaking your head? Okay, well then what's this one right here called? I can use a stick. Oh, there you go. What's that? <laughs> don't shake your head if you know the answer. I'm just kidding. I don't know what it is. I know which ones are labeled there. It's trying to give me a hard time. I'm a little sassy when I'm tired, so I just have to get used to it. So you can see, uh, and, this is, and this is helpful here, um, knowing, and this is kind of why I like um, the way our program here, and just PA school in general is structured about how we take anatomy and physiology. And you can kind of think back um, in having a good idea on the structure and function of these organs here, so that helps you kind of interpret your lab results and things. So you can see how in cholelithiasis, when you have stone caught in your common bile duct, how you're going to have elevated liver enzymes and elevated bilirubin because it's blocking. I pointed with my finger like this because it's blocking the flow of those uh, enzymes and stuff out, right? Because block right here. If you have the stone in your cystic duct from your gallbladder, you're not going to have that problem, correct? Because it's not blocking that outflow of. Uh, enzymes and things that the liver produces, correct? And then you can see how if you have a stone further on in your common bile duct, even down further where you get one near the sphincter of Odi and it uh, obstructs the pancreatic duct, how you can have elevation in pancreatic <coughs> enzymes. So you can have elevated pancreatic enzymes, so you can get pancreatitis and liver problems all from just one small little stone depending on where it is in the biliary tree. So. You can almost, I mean, I, you, you can pretty much diagnose, um, excuse me, uh, cholelithiasis or stone in the CBD just by looking at somebody's CMP. They're having right of quadrant abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, they look a little sick. All of a sudden you get their CMP back, their liver enzymes are ticked, um, and their bilirubin really might be a little bit elevated. You're like, well, bam, they got stone in the column bile duct versus normal, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that you can't have stone in your common bile duct and you have to have elevated liver enzymes, but um, it would stand to reason that if you have the elevated liver enzymes that the stone is further down in the common bile duct rather than just sitting in the gallbladder or in the cystic duct. Does that make sense? Yep, okay. Uh, here, <coughs> this is a gigantic common bile duct with a very large stone sticking in. I mean, that's huge. I don't have ability to measure it, but that's probably, I would say, like maybe two centimeters or something. Uh, upper ends of normals around eight millimeters. Um, so anything like eight and above is going to be some fairly clinically significant common bile duct dilation. Once you start getting around one centimeter and higher, uh, that's fairly significant for um, having a stone. Um, now a lot of, sometimes depending on what the stone is made of, you're not going to see them very well in CAT scan. So you, they'll see the common, but dial, the common uh, CBD dilation, but they won't see the stone. So just be uh, cognizant of that. Uh, as we already talked about, the key feature of these elevated liver enzymes and total bilirubin. Um, the CT again will show CBD dilation. Uh, it's not the best, but I'm just going to get ahead of myself. Uh, ultrasound, same as above. Better than CT, but harder to get and realize, uh, and it relies on the ultrasound tech interpretation. 
Um, you know, I've seen multiple ultrasound texts coming, uh, measure this CBD and stuff like that. It's a little bit off sometimes, but you know, CT doesn't show it. Get an ultrasound and see how that goes. And if that doesn't do any good, or you do confirm that, a lot of times uh, they'll get an MRCP, so they'll just do it with an MRI and see it. Um, or uh, a lot of times you'll get an ERCP, so this is an endoscopic um, procedure where they'll actually go down with the scope through your mouth, uh, through the stomach, through the small bowel, and then backtrack it up through the sphincter of Odie and actually go through, and you can see the biliary tree, and a lot of times, um, They'll just go there and retrieve the stone that way. Um, this is um, kind of, it is is the treatment for this, and so you have to have a uh, GI doctor that does that. Mercy, uh, for whatever reason, I don't know why, has like two GI doctors that actually do ERCPs, and so if those GI doctors aren't on at that time we have to send them to someplace else. Um, and even Mercy Maine, the Maine Mercy Hospital has to send their patients to Baptist uh, because an ERCP is the treatment of choice for this. <coughs> um, if you see it diagnosed on the CAT scan or ultrasound, um, if you have a elevated liver enzymes and you suspect a cholelithiasis or a common bile duct stone but don't see one on an ultrasound or CAT scan, uh, that's when we'll get the MRCP, um, and obviously the MRI is going to be very sensitive for it because it's going to show you all the fields playing there. <coughs> and then the treatment is just uh, stone retrieval through the ERCP, like I said. Uh, or if it's caused um, uh, cholecystitis, so an infected gallbladder, uh, they can do still laparoscopic uh, cholecystectomy. And then they'll do a, what's called an intraoperative cholangiography, where they go and they stick a catheter into the biliary tree and inject radio opaque dye into the biliary tree looking for obstructions. And they'll do that under a fluoroscopy. But that's by a surgeon, and that's at the whole um, where they have to do that in emergency medicine. But if you work in general surgery, uh, that's something that's often done. I think I had this, I had a patient that had post-ERCP pancreatitis, and I thought that, that was super important whenever I made this lecture. So I give it this whole slide <laughs> just for that. Uh, so yeah, if you have an ERCP, uh, that is a side effect of that. You can get some uh, post-ERCP pancreatitis just from basically um, injecting the dye and or uh, sticking the scope, you know, where it should belong up near the pancreas and all the biliary tree. That's not uncommon to happen. Any questions over any of that? Are you guys like following along pretty quickly with all this? Yeah, I mean, like I said, this is not cool stuff. Uh, cholecystitis, so inflammation of uh, gallbladder, it can be acute or chronic. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about the acute side, we'll leave the chronic side um, for the GI lecture that you guys have already had. <laughs> uh, acute, you can see some leukocytosis with a left shift, fever, infective sign of symptoms again, nausea, vomiting, vital fogger, and abdominal pain. You guys know about Murphy sign, correct? Now, fever, jaundice, you can still get those elevated liver enzymes um, as it uh, irritates the liver there. That's not uncommon. And then uh, you can also get the cholecystitis with the stone that's blocking it, backing up all the bile into the gallbladder, gets infected, and then produces uh, your cholecystitis. Again, labs imaging is going to be about the same. CT ultrasound. Uh, surgery, again, with or without the cholangiography to see if there's a common bile duct stone, what's the etiology. Uh, antibiotic, go to is just going to be a Zosin, uh, it's Piptazo, uh, that's got good uh, enteric coverage, good gram negative coverage. Um, if they're allergic to um, penicillin, Rocephin plus metronidazole is also a good one, um, and then Levaquin plus metronidazole as well. Bunch, there's a bunch of different antibiotic combinations for this, but it's important to get those on board. Um, there is some literature, uh, now the newer literature, I guess I should add this into my lecture, about just mm -hmm. treating uh, cholecystitis with antibiotics and not surgery. Uh, same thing with appendicitis. Um, I think that's kind of fringe stuff right now. I don't know too many people that are doing that. Um, most of the time it's just get the cut out because you don't need it. Okay, so here we have, is it hot in here or is it just me? 
Here we have a CT of obviously infected uh, gallbladder. You can see it's a very large dilated gallbladder and you have a very edematous gallbladder wall. This is right here. See it's very thick gallbladder wall. And you kind of have a little bit of what's called stranding. Uh, stranding is important to look for, a sign to look for um, on your CT scans. It's a sign of inflammation. Uh, we talked about stranding before. Anyways, it's this little kind of fuzzy stuff around the area. So you can see in a lot of these other images, and we'll see more in our small bowel images. Uh, see how a lot of these structures, I mean, obviously it's the kidney and small bowel, all the borders are very smooth um, and defined. As we get here, it starts to become more fuzzy and ill-defined. That's, that's a sign of uh, inflammation uh, on a CAT scan. It's called stranding. Um, so, you know, you can kind of peek through your CAT scan. Sometimes, depending on where you are, it takes up to an hour to get a CT back in red. Um, so you can kind of take a peek at these yourself. I mean, I hope we all can see that that doesn't look right. Um, and say they probably have this and get them started on some antibiotics or whatever. Okay. Any questions over any of that? Uh, cholangitis. Uh, so infection of the biliary tree above an obstruction. It doesn't necessarily have to be an obstruction, but it uh, most likely happens with it. Uh, same as cholecystitis, but this is more pronounced. Um, these people have jaundice, chills, they're septic. Uh, cholangitis is a very serious um, infection that does not need to be taken lightly. These people are very sick. Um, so it's uh, it obviously the infection of the gallbladder, but it involves the biliary tree as well. It's not isolated and it's starting to work up into the liver. Um, so again, with the labs, you're still going to have sorry um, your CBCs. You're going to have elevated. So, but here with sepsis, we're going to be getting lactic acid levels and things like that. These people are fairly sick and they're um, have pronounced liver enzymes here as well. Uh, that's going to be um, fairly significant whenever you have an infected gallbladder with elevated liver enzymes. Um, I think that cholangitis should definitely be taken into account when you're thinking about these things. Uh, treatment, um, not really that much different, but just something that we want to keep in the back of our minds um, that we just kind of don't want to blow off. Uh, antibiotics is going to be the same as your enteric cautions. Again, watch out for sepsis, get your lactic acids, get your procalcitonin levels. Um, uh, complications, perforation is higher in cholangitis, so you perf your gallbladder to get peritonitis and then die. It's not good. Any questions over cholangitis? Okay. Any questions over anything we just did? No? Easy stuff. Appendicitis, uh, inflammation along the appendix, most common cause of fecal lift. Um, it's one of the most common causes of an acute abdomen. Uh, second and third decade of life, but really, I mean, it can happen anytime. I've seen appendicitis in an eight year old and to a 97 year old. So it's more <coughs> uncommon in children. Um, the younger you get, at, you know, I don't have the exact figures, but younger children, I mean, you know, children's two, three, four, five, six years old are likely not going to have appendicitis. But it's possible, difficult to diagnose though. Because obviously you can't scan uh, every five year old that comes in with belly pain. Uh, classic signs and symptoms are going to be peri umbilical pain that radiates and localizes to the right lower quadrant. So you have somebody who's like, well, it's been hurting for 12 hours. It started around kind of the middle of my stomach, but now it's going down into right here. Um, and that's classic for appendicitis. McBurney's point tenderness, you guys know about that from physical exam. Nausea, vomiting, fever. Symptoms usually get progressively worse. Uh, it's a time to worry. Why would you worry about pain as intense and all of a sudden goes away? Sure. Sure. I don't need this lecture. Again, CBC, CMB, UA. Uh, CT ultrasound. <clears throat> Ultrasound's used um, more infrequently. It's difficult to get a good picture of your um, appendix as opposed to your gallbladder that's, you know, implanted in one place underneath your liver. Your liver kind of holds it tight. Your appendix 
can be in a bunch of different weird positions. You get retrocecal appendages that are facing backwards and down and up. I've seen them in so many different spots. Um, so ultrasound is a little bit more tricky. Um, so on this, I would just usually get a CAT scan going straight if you're looking for appendicitis. Um, but if you're um, in you know, a large tertiary facility and you have a young child, um, that you want to see if you can get an ultrasound of their appendix first uh, without exposing them to a lot of radiation. That's also a thought, too. Uh, they do that a lot at Children's Hospital, uh, but not a lot of other places. Uh, really skinny people need to get triple contrast. That's IV, rectal, and oral contrast. Because um, you need uh, a lot of fat, or not a lot of fat, you need fat in space um, in between your... Um, bowel to help a radiologist find and differentiate the appendix. I mean, they're trying to look for something, you know, that's typically the size of your pinky or smaller in everything that's in your entire stomach, and so sometimes it's a little difficult to see. Um, so rectal uh, contrast will help them differentiate where the uh, large intestine is and rectum and from opposed to um, where that appendix is uh, attached. Uh, treatment, surgery, and again, uh, antibiotic Sosin is a good one. The other antibiotics with enteric coverage, uh, like we just talked about, some people are going uh, towards, um, there is some research in going towards using antibiotics only to treat this infection and not surgery. I haven't personally had any experience with that, but it definitely is in the literature. So just be aware of it. You know, it's, I don't know, you might come across I don't know, uh, anemic Mormon or something like that that doesn't want surgery and just wants antibiotics. So that's you know, an option there. Any questions over appendicitis? You guys got all that right. I mean, that's probably, I mean, that's bread and butter. That's easy stuff. <clears throat> all right, diverticulitis. Uh, so infection um, and subsequent micro perforation of the diverticulates, outpatient, uh, out pouching of the large intestine. About 25% of people will have diverticulosis, um, will get diverticulitis. Uh, a lot of people have diverticulosis and never know it. They'll have it for their entire lives unless they got a CAT scan or a colonoscopy that shows it. They'll have no idea that they have it. Um, typically older adults, I guess the mean age here is 63, which I think is probably fairly correct. A lot of the people I diagnose with diverticulitis are in uh, older populations. Uh, classic is going to be left lower quadrant abdominal pain. That's not always the case, but you know, for testing purposes and for your boards, um, I would think left lower quadrant abdominal pain in an older person, you should definitely be thinking diverticulitis should be on the top of your list. Uh, it can involve uh, the cecum um, that would cause, excuse me, right lower quadrant abdominal pain. So again, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, fever. Blood in the stool would be indicative of the small micro perforations you get from the diverticula to quiet positive stools. Um, here, same workup. CT is going to be your diagnostic imaging of choice. Um, so this treatment is uh, mostly medical. You just do antibiotics for it, but there can be surgery depending on um, if they have any diverticular abscess or phlegmon. Uh, phlegmon is just a collection of infectious material and not necessarily um, kind of, I guess, liquidy would be the term for the abscess um, versus a phlegmon would be more uh, consolidated and dense infectious material that you can't drain. And then you also, uh, if you have perforation, you need to get in there and um, uh, wash them out with the surgery. But most of the time it's just uh, antibiotics. Um, Inpatient versus outpatient treatment. Um, you know, these things, it all depends on what you're looking at, because I kind of told you last time I lectured about taking everybody and using the whole picture. Um, so it, you got to think about pain management, because their chief complaint is going to be pain. Uh, labs or vital signs, their age. You know, if you get a 98-year-old with an elevated white blood cell count, and she looks like she's uncomfortable, probably want to keep that one in here versus a 55-year-old who has good vital signs, not tachycardic, not febrile, has a mild case of diverticulitis, you can put them on some antibiotics and go home. Um, so risk stratification and disposition on those people are um, kind of a judgment call, I think. It just depends on how uh, you're looking at those people and certain comorbidities. Um, antibiotics, uh, outpatients can be Cipro, Flagyl. 
uh, inpatient Zosin or Cipro and Flagyl again, just give it IV. Um, not a lot of difference, I don't think, in. Um, no, I'm not going to tell you that. I think that's a different thing. Never mind. So, Cipro Flagyl outpatient treatment, Zosin or Cipro Flagyl for inpatient treatment as well. Uh, pain management, surgery consult if you see an abscess or anything uh, drainable there as well. Any questions over that? Here, uh, here's some diverticulitis. It, you know, it's difficult to see, but this is more indicative of stranding. You can see how here, um, see how these very crisp, well this is, you know, that's a muscle there. Um, these crisp lines um, through these small bowels. you see how this is very blurry and fuzzy around these edges. Uh, that's indicative of the inflammation again. And um, of course this is on the left side of the patient. When you're looking at CT, you're looking at it in reverse. I would, I would um, suggest um, that you guys take a look at uh, a lot of the CTs that you order. Just, just look at them and slowly start to build up your knowledge. And I know we don't teach. Do we teach that radiology here, like CT stuff at all? Or? A lot of time spent on that. Okay. I mean, yeah. Because obviously that's the same thing. Because no, I mean, radiologists read that stuff anyways. You're not going to read your own CTs and then just do whatever you want based on that. But you can start to get a better clinical picture looking at them yourself. So look at all your CTs of the head and brain. Um, see what a normal one looks at. Look at your abdomen so you can kind of peek and you can get ahead of the eight ball on a lot of different things uh, looking at what you find there and get a better idea as you're waiting for a radiologist to read it. Um, so I would encourage you to look at your CAT scans often. I'm not going to talk about interception because that is a pediatric thing. We're not doing that in this course right now. Uh, ischemic bowel. Um, so anything that reduces the blood flow to the bowel, I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory, right? Uh, 60 or 70 percent caused by acute insufficiency, the mesenteric artery blood flow, so mesenteric ischemia. <clears throat> you know, epidemiology is going to be anything that's going to predispose you to clot formation. Um, so it would be cardiac disease, peripheral artery disease, uh, aortic hardware, things like that are going to predispose you to clot formation. Um, so a classic description is going to be abdominal pain out of proportion to physical exam. You see that on a test anywhere that's ischemic bowel. I mean that's like almost, I don't know, it's not, it's not pathognomonic and abdominal pain out of proportion to physical exam is probably one of the most um, subjective things you could ever tell anybody in their life because I felt a lot of abdomens that these people said that they were 10 out of 10 pain. I said, all right, if I were to, and I actually told this to a person and I got in trouble for it, but I was just fed up with it. I said, all right. I said, if I were to douse you in gasoline and light you on fire, you would have been no more pain than you are now. And she's like, I don't know why you're over there making jokes. This is a serious thing. <laughs> Whatever. You know, but for testing purposes, pain out of proportion to physical uh, exam is going to be pretty, uh, I, would, I would start thinking some kind of ischemic valve disease. Uh, sudden onset, severe periumbilical. So anytime you think of ischemic thing, um, you remember that mnemonic that we went over, less the uh, differential diagnosis mnemonic that had all the, um, the vindicate mnemonic, right? Of course you guys remember because we talked about it like two weeks ago. All right, good. Uh, one of them we're talking about ischemia or vascular etiologies. Anytime I think about ischemic etiologies, it's going to be the same thing as like having a heart attack. You just have it someplace else. So it's going to be, you know, it, a sudden onset, doesn't get worse, sharp shooting pain. It's, it's, it's debilitating because, I mean, you're actually having cellular death due to lack of oxygen for whatever reason um, to that area. <clears throat> Nausea, vomiting, blood in the stool. Uh, Pain after eating, that's seen more with chronic. So you can have some chronic mesentery ischemia where you guess don't where you don't have quote unquote infarction. Um, but we're talking more about the true ischemic bowel in acute setting right now. Uh, distended abdomen, peritoneal signs, decreased bowel sounds are all going to be classic with that. Um, again, getting the same uh, blood uh, blood work up. Lactic acid is the only thing that's a little bit different in this one. Um, that you kind of need to 
excuse me, to get. Uh, you know, sometimes it's difficult to see the ischemia on a CAT scan. They will see some kind of stranding or either around the small or large bowel, but they don't quite know exactly what's coming out. And this is where the lactic acid comes into play. Um, this will help be a piece of the puzzle. Obviously, you're going to have a buildup of lactic acid when you don't have enough oxygen to provide the tissues, right? Um, so, in a lot of my old patient abdominal pain, uh, even if they have, you know, stone cold normal vital signs, they're not febrile, they're not tachycardic, I'm not necessarily thinking uh, sepsis, I will get a lactic acid for that reason. Um, and so, I've... Uh, said that to many, uh, many uh, general surgeons um, about an old person that had sudden onset abdominal pain. Uh, they show some stranding around the mesentery um, and they have it elevated, but you know, the radiologist couldn't quite pin, that, pin it down what exactly is causing it, but they, you know, their lactic acid is poor and there's no real reason, no other infectious etiology for that is what it caused. Um, that's one of the things that if you don't get it, you're not going to find it. So these ones are the kind of scary ones. You know, if you shot down everybody with a bunch of GI labs, you're going to catch a lot of the stuff we already talked about just based on labs. But if you don't order black gas in these particular instances, you're, you're not going to catch that. Um, CT abdomen, pelvis, highly sensitive for the thrombosis. You see a big clot. Obviously, you're going to see it when you get the IV contrast. Um, treatment is going to be supportative, fluids, pain meds, gastric decompression with NG tube, uh, anticoagulation if they're not actively bleeding, that restricts surgery, obviously broad spectrum antibiotics uh, to prevent infection. And then surgery is going to be, you know, you can have an embolectomy if you get a vascular surgeon that can sneak up in there and actually take the clot out if it's a large, you know, I, I would assume they do that if it's like a clot in your celiac artery or, you know, your S, uh, SMA or something like that. Um, but a lot of times we'll just do some bowel resection if uh, they get in there and see that the bowel is um, necrotic and dead. They'll just take that section of the bowel out and the anastomose the other ones if needed. Um, sometimes this can be pretty devastating. I've seen people um, eventually die from this because um, so much of their bowel was embarked at that you couldn't save enough to live on. And so that's something that's important as well. You're not just thinking about one section, depending on where that clot is. Um, I had a case one time where the surgeon came in and just said, you know, I'm sorry, we can't do anything. You're going to die in a couple of days um, because they're, all their bowels and parked it. So it can suck sometimes. Uh, this, this isn't necessarily CT indicative of just the mesenteric ischemia. It, um, you can see that pattern a lot. In different areas uh, with small bowel obstructions too, but you can definitely see the noted dilation um, and uh, inflammation of the small bowel uh, wall and um, the stranding around. Looks like they got some kind of small bowel obstruction there too, because you see those air fluid levels. Um, you know, if we see a CT like that, well, obviously we're all going to know that something's wrong. Any questions over any of the mesenteric ischemias? Nope. Excuse me, uh, okay, I think this is the last one. Small bowel obstruction uh, is functional versus mechanical, so it's kind of ileus versus some kind of um, structure that's um, preventing uh, small bowel motility. Uh, risk factor, so prior abdominal surgery, adhesions, I mean, that's like your number one risk factor uh, for having small bowel obstructions. It's adhesions secondary to previous abdominal surgeries. Um, Test questions wise, um, board questions wise, you get a patient that's having abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, afebrile, and they kind of make a point. A lot of times they'll make a point to give you information that they don't always give you in a lot of other things. Um, they kind of make a point to say, hey, they had a previous surgery, you know, six years ago, blah, blah, They've had multiple abdominal surgeries, whatever. I would start thinking of that pretty highly on my um, list differentials. And then obviously you can get uh, small bowel obstructions if you have a hernia that has a loop of small bowel going through it that's obstructed, um, neoplasm, or body ingestations. Uh, irradiation too from uh, cancer treatment can cause that. Abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, constipation, 
Um, you know, this constipation, this not having a bowel movement thing, I think is kind of, it is a little tough. I had a old, um, an old school ER doctor one time, had a guy, we had, it was when I was working in Oklahoma City, a patient was transferred in that had a CT diagnosed small bowel obstruction, and he was sent there for a surgery consult, and he got him in, and he sent him home, because he had normal bowel sounds, and was um, passing stool. And he was like, how can you have small bowel obstruction if they're passing stool? You can't pass stool whenever you have small bowel obstruction. I mean, the concept kind of rings true, but uh, I don't know if I'd be as aggressive as that. But just know, um, you shouldn't have a whole lot of uh, bowel movements with a small bowel obstruction. Uh, fever, you have some blood in the stool, blood and vomit, high pitched bowel sounds is going to be one of your, you know, pathogenic mnemonic things. Uh, they start out high pitched, uh, but then they can progressively go become hypoactive uh, in later courses of treatment as the bowel just stops moving, peristalsis uh, inhibits. <clears throat> Imaging labs, same as the belly labs. So CT versus x ray. You know, this is my own personal. soapbox, and I'm not saying that it's right, this is just the way I think, and Lord knows I've done some stupid shit in my life, so this may be one of them, but I think abdominal x-rays are probably the most worthless thing you could ever get on anybody. A lot of people disagree with that. Uh, I only get abdominal x-rays on somebody that I think is constipated, and like think nothing else but constipation. Um, they're not that sensitive. You can see, you know, the classic air fluid levels, dilated small bowel. Um, you can sometimes see kidney stones on a KUB, not all the time. You can sometimes see gallstones on there. But if you see any of that and it, you have a surgical abdomen or anything that needs a surgery consult, the first thing a surgeon is going to be is like, well, what does their CAT scan show? Not what did you read on your x ray? So you're going to get an x ray. You're going to wait, get all this stuff back, see what they have, and then you're just going to reorder a CAT scan again. I mean, that, that to me makes no sense, but that's just my soapbox. Uh, you can see a small bowel obstruction on an x-ray, but I would think that the very next thing you're going to end up doing is getting the CAT scan. Um, can you see, can you miss a subtle, small, a subtle, small, small bowel obstruction on your x-ray? Absolutely. Um, so I, I don't get them very often, other people do, it's just one of those things. Uh, here's your x-ray, as you can see, I mean obviously you see the dilated uh, small bowel, the air fluid level, right? We all see, I don't have to point to it, you know what you're looking at, right? Okay. I didn't see a whole lot of head shakes, so let's just make sure. Um, so air fluid level, right? Air, fluid's more dense level, right? <laughs> it's in the name. Anyways, okay, so here we see it on CT. Same thing. Dilated small bowel, air fluid level, um, except instead of being upright, they're laying back. Um, and this looks like they've given them all oral contrast, so you see over there on the uh, pictures left, but they're right. Um, all that white contrast media that's inside of the stomach that looks like a um, uh, oral contrast. So you can do that a lot uh, with um, a lot of places still get oral contrast with their small bowel follow through to make you drink um, like a little Gatorade bottle of gadolinium or something like that and you wait a couple of hours as it to go through and then you get the uh, CAT scan or sometimes x-ray um, and you can see where uh, that contrast material stops and you can see the transition point with that small bowel. Um, you can still see uh, small bowel obstructions with just regular IV contrast. Excuse me. Um, sometimes they're a little more subtle um, and not a complete obstruction. Sometimes they're incomplete, so that's where oral contrast will come in. But uh, sometimes when somebody has a true massive small bowel obstruction, I mean, nothing is going down. Everything's trying to build back up. So, I mean, they're, they're vomiting like crazy. They're vomiting everywhere. So, it's sometimes a little difficult to get those people to drink that stuff. Um, they absolutely have to have it 
you, uh, you know, you just drop in the G tube down, decompress the valve, and then prep, push the stuff through the NG tube. Um, but that's kind of a more aggressive action. <coughs> uh, treatment as uh, MPO fluids, gastric decompression pain meds. So basically, it's just uh, letting their um, small bowel kind of heal itself. Uh, give it some time to chill out. That's if it's um, a functional small bowel obstruction, whether it's from an ileus or something like that, or some medication that's decreasing peristalsis or causing that small bowel obstruction. Um, if it's from adhesions or scar tissue or any kind of uh, hernia or uh, foreign body or any kind of mass that's pressing on the bowel causing that obstruction, they're obviously going to need surgery to come relieve that because you can't um, no amount of small bowel rest or gastric decompression is going to release the pressure on that um, adhesions. Uh, so a lot of times um, you're going to need um, a surgical consult with these. Uh, so we don't keep any small bowel obstructions at our hospital uh, because they want a surgery consult. I'd say your typical course is going to be about a two to three day of MPO and medical management and then a surgeon will come in and step in if it's just a truly functional small bowel obstruction or ileus. Now, if you see CT evidence of a definite transition point uh, from scar tissue or some kind of mass, then obviously surgery's gonna step in sooner. Uh, NG2 is one of your big ones to put in. Put those down in the ER. Uh, they suck. Have any of you guys ever had an NG2 before? Yeah, they're, they're terrible. They're probably one of the hardest things to put in because you typically do them, um, you do them, most of the time you do them on an awake patient. No one likes to have a tube stuck down their nose into their stomach. Um, but it's, it, it, it helps them a lot in the long run, so sometimes it takes a little uh, forceful convincing that they need it. <clears throat> wow, we're done. How about that? It's like 45 minutes, right? Mm -hmm. I know you guys are happy. <laughs> Questions about anything? Anything we talked about? I know this lecture is not really that fun. It's not really that cool, but you know, <clears throat> um, non-traumatic abdominal pain and surgical abdomens or something. Abdominal pain, you're going to see that every day, 20 times a day in the ER, all the time. Um, test questions wise, just focus on the things that are kind of more pathognomonic for you know, pain out of proportion, pain after eating fat, 40, and fertile, things like that. Those are your typical um, question-wise from emergency abdomens. Uh, but in a more realistic sense, whenever you get on rotations, um, being able to kind of feel out uh, an abdomen and what abdominal pain is fairly serious and what abdominal pain is not, that's, that's an experience thing. It takes, you have to just see a bunch of them and kind of, you get kind of a little bit of a gut feeling on when you press on somebody's belly, whether somebody is really truly tender, you need full port press on them, or whether somebody can just probably do maybe a little bit of labs or uh, watchful waiting, things like that, because everybody in their dog with gastroenteritis is going to come in with nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. And if you you know do blood work, labs, CAT scans on every single one of those people, you're going to take up a lot of your time. So uh, it's difficult um, to kind of get the clinical gestalt for it, but. Don't worry, you will over time start to develop a kind of sixth sense for it. But that caveat, I've seen some weird stuff. And if you have any weird feelings, just get your CAT scan. I've seen had a cholecystitis on a patient that was like 60 something that um, had abdominal pain for six months, like chronic abdominal pain, and had multiple ER visits for chronic abdominal pain multiple scans um, that were all negative over the past like four or six months and I don't know something just didn't feel right with her had no elevated white blood cell count normal labs and uh, something just didn't quite feel right with her scan her and she had freaking cholecystitis it was bizarre so anyways all right enjoy early lunch <laughs>